let's look at a, a different passage now that bears on this. And if you want to look at Colossians 3 for a moment, we can start there and then take another one to just help us begin to get a picture out of which uh, what we were talking about uh, begins to make more sense. Uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If you have been raised with Christ, uh, others put it in terms of since you have been raised with Christ, that's okay been raised up with Christ, seek those things that are above. Now, we, we need to talk about what that means because we're not talking about the moon. Okay, but <laughs> seek those things that are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Now that goes with all things have been, all power has, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. See, that's saying the same thing. So that's where you want your mind to be where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead. There's a piece of good news. <laughs> We're past that. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So among other things, that means you don't know what your life is. You want to remember that. <laughs> okay. You don't know. Your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you also will appear. Glorious. Glorious. Now that's a particular landscape in which you live as a person who has entered the kingdom of God and who is living from what is there and not what is in the visible world. Now, Paul works through that very carefully, as you may recall, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, where he talks about the outward man perishing. And this is a part of that great passage where he introduces the contrast between the treasure and the vessel and the knowledge of God through the face of Jesus Christ once you understand what that is, that's the treasure. The vessel is the outward environment in which you live, including your body. And if you look in the mirror, you begin to see that the outward man is perishing. Right? The body is like a house. No matter how well it's built, just give it time and it'll start to sag. It'll start to sag, and parts will get lower and higher, <laughs> and that's the outward man. Now, Paul is also talking about the pressure of events, and he gives a list of the things that he was going through, and you see the two sides, the treasure and the vessel. Hmm? Sorrowful vessel. Always rejoicing, treasure. You know that passage now, and I tend to get immersed in passages and spend too much time on them for what I have to say to you, so I, I'll try to, to say, now you know that passage, right? So you can work through that, and it'll help you a lot, because our life is a matter of a treasure in a vessel. And the problem is that we tend to be obsessed with the vessel, and not with the treasure. Once you understand that principle, you'll understand a lot that we talked about in the last hour, about church organizations and so on, because they get wrapped up in their vessel. And then one of the worst things that can happen to them is they get obsessed with surviving. 
And of course, it's all over at that point because the church, its aim is not surviving. God's in charge of that. The church is dealing with what we were talking about here. That's what it's called to do. If it does that, it will prosper. Nothing can stop it. If it doesn't do that, it'll wind up trying to survive. A church that is struggling to survive, you might as well let it go. But that's one of the most traumatic things to Christians generally, to live through the death of a church, because they are not thinking in terms of what is above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. That's, the, that's where the church is. Nobody sees the church but God. He's the one that sees it, and he's the one that runs it. And we have to keep that in mind when we are taking care of our little station, whatever that may be, or our big station. God is the one in charge. He's the landscape. He's the landscape. So Paul goes on to say the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. While we look not at things that are visible, but at things that are invisible. See, one of the things you get when you get born again is the ability to see the invisible. Now, you have to be told that if you don't know it already. You have to be told that so you can begin to recognize it when it happens. It's like hearing God. God talks to everybody all the time. But if you don't know what it is and listen for it, you will never know it. And you live life on your own. You won't look at the invisible, you look at the visible. For the things that are visible are temporal. But the things that are invisible are eternal. Now you decide. You decide. Second Kings 6, 16 through 17. You'll have to check me to see if I get the right reference. You remember the story of Elijah's butler? Who went out to pick up the paper and bring it in one morning. And as he raised up, saw himself surrounded by an army. Did I get the right passage? Second Kings six sixteen through seventeen. Is that the right passage? So he was really excited, wasn't he? And he came back in, and what did he say? Anybody got it? What did he say? Did I get the right passage? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, but what did the butler say before that? What shall we do? What shall we do? We've had it. Now then, read what Elijah, Elijah said back to him. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Two different landscapes, okay? One is the visible, one is the invisible. Now, when we approach our lives, especially if we are followers of Christ, we have to always remember those two landscapes. Now, this is, of course, just biblical stuff, right? Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible. And it is the consciousness of the, the landscape of the kingdom of God that allows us to walk in that kingdom with Christ and see the deliverance that comes by grace in that kingdom. Remember, grace is simply God acting. And the kingdom of God is what God is doing. 
Now, you in your theological classes, you will hear words like rain. It's the rain of God. But the rain is just what is God doing? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is that? You're going to tell someone how to do that. What are you going to say to them? Hmm? What is the kingdom of God? You need to know what it is in order to seek it, don't you? What is it? It's God acting. Very simple. Now, of course, that includes reigning. Because God acts in many ways. And the kingdom of God is present in many forms. We're experiencing a dimension of the kingdom of God when we come out here into the hills and look at the critters. Okay. That's one of the manifestations of the kingdom of God. That's why it's such a blessing to people who don't even know anything about the kingdom of God. They, they come out and look at a tree or a mountain and go, ah, oh, something about that. What is it? It's just dirt. You know. Rock. It's because that's one of the witnesses of the kingdom. And you know, in Psalm 19, it says that, doesn't it? And then Paul picks up that same theme in Romans 10, where he's talking about the gospel. That's real. How does the kingdom of God come in his law? I can tell anyone how to find the kingdom of God. Just take the Ten Commandments and do them. You will soon find that only God can support you and you will experience God in action when you do that. God's law is an expression of His kingdom. You want to find the kingdom of God? Act in the law. That's what Jesus is talking about in His updated form when He says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's how you find the kingdom of God. Now, at its premium best, you find it in the words of Jesus. That's, a, that's the best form it comes in. He comes with his word. And if you study... John 6, carefully, where he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And, you know, it really gets those folks in that culture excited. Because they didn't think you should do that. Drink his blood. I mean, that was, drinking blood was about the farthest thing you could imagine. I have to get those pagans up in Scotland to talk about blood pudding, but for goodness sakes. <laughs> But he said, now, you folks, calm down. Uh, you're misreading this. The flesh doesn't profit anything. It's the spirit that brings life. And the words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. So that's why... You go to the words of Jesus as if you had found a treasure trove of life. Because in them, the kingdom of God comes to you and invites you to step into them. Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. It's right here. The word is nigh thee. It is in thy mouth. It is the word of faith that we preach, Paul says. The power of the word. When you accept it into yourself, brings the kingdom of God to life in you. Now, you have some growing to do because he doesn't just wipe out everything and erase it all, push the delete button and start over again. You still are you after you're born again. And there's a lot of you that has yet to be dealt with. Being justified by faith, we now have peace with God. But the war that was between us and God now breaks out within ourselves. 
and the parts of the self, which is a massive reality, have to be taken in hand by effort and grace. So the real question in what we call spiritual formation is what to do. Spiritual growth comes in response to intelligent, informed effort. Now, that's the human side of holiness. We have to learn and we have to make the effort. And if we do nothing, nothing will happen. Now, if you have a theology that has got you frozen to the point that you can't do anything, I don't know what to tell you. An old preacher used to say, the only thing you have to do to go to hell is do nothing. It's all taken care of. Tickets paid. Just do nothing. Now, of course, no one consistently lives the theology. And they are confused about earning something and doing something. And they have mis been misled into thinking that all doing is earning. Hmm? Mm -hmm. But when you lift the food with your fork to your mouth, you don't earn anything. But you get to eat. No one hands you some merit for lifting the food with your fork to your mouth. That's action. It's not earning. There's a lot of good things involved in it. But the only issue is not earning. The real issue, once you settle the earning issue, which is you're not into that, is action. And that's where you need to have that picture of the landscape and to be able to express it in terms of the kingdom of God and the invitation to enter the kingdom of God. So let's take a little time to just work on that. What is the kingdom of God? It is the range of God's effective will. It's where what God wants done is done. That's the kingdom of God. When you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that's what you're praying for. You're praying for God's effective will. What God wants done is done. Now, you might say, well, everything is like that. Well, if God wanted it to be that way, he could do it that way, but he's not laid it out like that. And he has given you a kingdom, or in your case, a queendom. Right? That's good too. And he expects you to have a domain where you have your way. That's not bad. That's good. Let's suppose I were to just take this up here. <laughs> start looking through it, <laughs> rummaging around, saying, oh, I wonder what's in there. How are you feeling right now? Violated. Violated. <laughs> this is her queendom. Okay? She has a right to say what goes on here. Now, every person is like that, and that's God's appointment. That's why you're worth dying for. And he has great plans for each one of us. And we get born, and we come into the world, and we have this little thing called a body. And that's our first challenge. Because when we get here, our effective will is worth very little. And our first task is to grow with our body. And how we love to see that in a child. And they are meant to grow. And the mastery of their body. You see, your body is the primary place of your kingdom. And if you didn't have a body, you couldn't even use a credit card. Your body is the primary place of your kingdom. And that's good. That's as it was meant to be. 
and maybe we'll talk more about body depending on how things go, but this is, the body is absolutely central to the spiritual life. Absolutely central. But it is meant, among other things, to extend. And this is a part of the natural world as well as the spiritual world. But the natural world is meant to be under the spiritual world. But just human beings on their own, because of what they're able to do and learn and extend their body, can do incredible things. We get used to them today, but they're incredible things that you, that you do. Now, when you start out in Genesis 1.26, the first thing you're given charge of are fish. Whoopee. Right? Now, we're still hung on fish. You can make a living selling fish to look at or to eat. But, you know, that's where we entered historically God's creation. We were in charge of animals, creeping things. So cockroaches are in your charge. You can decide what to do with them. <laughs> I hope you'll have time to meditate on Genesis 1.26 while you're here, because that's the picture of you. You are a creative being under God. Your soul hungers for that, your life, that's expressed in technological progress. Um, some years ago, a bunch of killer whales got trapped in an ice flow. What was the human response? Let's go get them out. That's natural. That's what we are made for, is to be in charge of the earth. The killer whales don't think, there's some people down in trouble in a mudslide in Mexico. Let's go get them out. Right? And the next time you're challenged with how close a chimpanzee is to you, just think about what the chimpanzees spend their time thinking about and what they don't spend their time thinking about. See, that's, that's the human kingdom. And socially, it's, it's essentially social. Because nearly everything that we can do individually depends upon the development of the social context. Just think about education. Education is essentially a social process. If it's not, it's going to be very limited. Money. Transportation. Computers, for heaven's sake. We're having trouble with Twitters and people who send messages while they drive trains and airplanes and automobiles. See, that's what the kingdom of man does. It gets out of control. And, of course, more deeply at the level of sin, which becomes socially organized and has to be dealt with in terms of what? What's the answer to sin? Well, the only answer you will hear from the human point of view is education. What is the answer to all of the problems? Education, education, education. That would be true if you were getting the right education, but education in what? When Jesus comes, to announce the availability of the kingdom of God, he is the world's primary educator. And if you have trouble thinking of him in that connection, please stretch your concepts a bit. Because the force of Jesus in the world has been mainly through education that went with grace to transform life. Well, I'll get off of that now. But if you understand what the kingdom of God is, the range of God's effective will, you have to start with what a kingdom is, and your best way of understanding that is to know your kingdom. And the easiest people to teach us are kids, because believe me, they know about it. All they need is a word for it. 
But they're in, in the kingdom struggles from the start. If you have more than one child in your home, you know how the, king, the kingdoms clash. And a main part of what you have to teach them is how to live with one another, how to live with other people. If you read the little Calvin book, you'll remember that in one passage he talks, says, every man carries a kingdom in his breast. That's the problem. The main threat to God's kingdom in my life is me and my kingdom. And that's the human story. And that's, you watch marriages and families and economic situations and so on, it's kingdoms clashing. What happened on Wall Street? A bunch of kingdoms ran amok and destroyed some other ones. Mr. Madoff, who must have been named by God, um, you know, I mean, that can't be an accident. <laughs> he made off with it. But now, you see, what was that kingdom stuff? Now, he learned how to work with powers in order to ruin the lives of thousands upon thousands of people. And what did that amount to? That meant to destroying the reach of their effective will. Because that's what money is all about. Money is a way of extending your kingdom. If you have a little money, you can go to a funny looking building on the street and get someone to give you a hamburger. Otherwise, you'll have to take a gun with you if you want a hamburger. See, all of that, now once you get this picture, and that's why I'm spending so much time on it. Now then, the two landscapes. Because the problem is always to determine what are the realities that you can count on. And the major thing you have to understand to get your life straight is the fundamental reality in your life is God and his kingdom. That's the fundamental reality. Now, you don't have to accept that. And you can insist on having your own kingdom. And uh, many of the people who are famous now for developing what has been called the new atheism are basically people who are asserting their own kingdom and the human kingdom and saying, we will not have God. Because if there is a God, my kingdom is not ultimate. And then you come right down to the basic activities and teachings of Jesus about the cross. What is the cross? The cross is the end of your kingdom. That's what the cross is. That's why you have to take it to follow Jesus. You cannot be my disciple unless you take your cross daily and follow me. You can't do it. Now, he means you can't succeed with it because the demands of discipleship will overwhelm you if you're trying to run your own show. So you have to give up on that and take up your cross. And the cross means the end of self-will. And if the, only, if the only landscape you see is the visible, when well, you're going to think, that's the worst thing that could happen to me. And that's what many people, Christians, think when they read the Sermon on the Mount. They think, this would ruin my life. And you know what? It would. <laughs> but there's another life. And that is the place where we begin to see and to enter the kingdom of God. And putting our faith in Jesus Christ means that we count on him to be totally reliable about what is real. So you go back to the first two of the Ten Commandments, those are statements about reality. The first two of the Ten Commandments are designed to protect you from thinking that the only reality is the visible world. And that you are visible yourself. Well, in a sense you are, of course, but in a sense you aren't. And on God's side, that's where he comes looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit, it's what you really are on the inside, because that's what gets at your kingdom. That's what gets at your kingdom. 
And for the most part, you don't see that, like Elisha's butler. Because frankly, if you had to live with that around you all the time, that would be the end of your life. You can imagine what your life would be like if you could not, not see the kingdom. That's why God has made that possible. He is so big that if he didn't hide, you couldn't avoid him. So he is a hidden God. And now then, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> so that's where seeking the kingdom becomes all important. See, that's, that's why it's important that you be free, because it's with your freedom that you come to be the person that God wants you to be. It's with your freedom, not coerced. If God wanted that, he could do it like that. No more sin. It's all done. That's not what he has in mind. He has in mind you bringing your kingdom into his kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom then is this. Life in the kingdom is available to us now. We can experience the kingdom and live in it by placing our confidence in Jesus for everything. And by being his constant students, precisely because we have confidence in him. So now the only saving advice, if you wish, is, guess what? Trust Jesus. That's the whole deal. Right? That's how you enter the kingdom. Not just something he did, or something he said, but him. The whole person. The lady in the back, please. I just had a quick question. If you could repeat the part about uh, he is so big. He His, God is so big that he has to hide in order that we can hide from him. <laughs> right. Now, see, that was the project. Where are you, Adam? That's a deep, great preaching text and all of that. And you have to work whether or not you think God knew where Adam was all along. That's open theology territory. But it has deep implications either way you will go. But the point is, he was hiding. He was hiding. And that is the human enterprise. One reason why we love children so much is because they haven't yet learned to hide their souls inside their bodies. Did you know that? They can't do it. Our little Becky, when she was little, learned there were such things as jokes. But she didn't know how to tell them. And so she would tell something she thought was a joke and just fall in the floor laughing. <laughs> but to tell a joke, you have to keep the cat in the bag. That's hiding. Right? You have to know when to let the cat out of the bag. In order to do that, you have to be able to manage your body in a certain way. So timing is crucial. All of that goes into kingdom. See? Because the kingdom, kingdom stuff is the only thing that allows you to understand human life. And most people in their battles with one another are just like two dogs fighting over a bone in an alley. They have no idea what's going on. That's the effect of lust, to use the colorful word, in human life. It destroys the soul. It tears it apart. And people have no idea what's going on. And yet they're so self-righteous and full of themselves that they think they could tell you exactly what's wrong. It's usually with you, not them. So this idea of kingdom now is, is really fundamental. And uh, the uh, teaching about the gospel then comes 
you agree that that's what that Jesus preached the kingdom of God and its availability that's what he preached now every New Testament scholar no matter what their theology knows that that is true you simply can't deal with the text without knowing that but then you have elaborate theologies designed to set that aside and comes with various names and various versions and so on. That's the theology I was raised in. And it was extremely common. Was that what Jesus said was of no relevance to us today. What Paul said was it. And of course, if you read, I mean, if you can do what Paul said, you can take the Sermon on the Mount at a walk. Did you know that? Paul and Jesus didn't preach different things. Just do Ephesians 4 and 5, and then go back and look at the Sermon on the Mount. It looks like old news. Right? But the theology was designed to protect us from the Gospels. There's no question what Jesus preached. He preached. Now, he didn't just preach that there was a kingdom of God, that would have been ho-hum again. Everyone knew that. What was different was the accessibility of the kingdom. And that was really radical. From a human point of view, that's what got him killed. Because what he taught was the kingdom is at hand to you, no matter where you are. And the people who thought they were in charge of the kingdom did not like that. And so it's this inversion that drew the wrath of people in power, both secular and sacred, as we say, down on him and from a human point of view. It's right there in the scriptures. Do you not know that one man would do better to perish than that the whole nation perish? This was said by a man who was totally absorbed in human stuff and he knew his position was in threat and he would lose his job and the Romans would come down on everyone and so forth so that's just politics is all that is that happens every day all around the earth from the human point of view okay well how much time do we have before lunch it's about time. Okay, well, let me get you started on this. And uh, we have to build on this foundation now of the kingdom and the message that is preached. Because you cannot go anywhere with holiness with the wrong message. You cannot go anywhere with spiritual formation in Christ, with transformation, with the wrong message. So now, let's just uh, think about these. I've given you three Gospels that are commonly heard at present. And now, you know, you don't worry about disagreeing with me. You can disagree with me about everything. Howard's going to grade you. I'm not. <laughs> but, so anything I say, I may be wrong, as I said. So. You take it in that spirit. But practically speaking, three Gospels are heard at present. Now, the first one I list is the one that's more common in our context. That is the context of uh, we who sort of are evangelicals and we uh, are concerned about uh, uh, forgiveness of sins. It's not the only one that is because actually number three also is big on forgiveness of sins. It's much older than what we are caught in today. Or, but the first is simply, this is the gospel. Your sins will be forgiven and you will be in heaven in the afterlife if you believe that Jesus suffered for your sins. Now, if you listen to the wonderful men who are, and I'm not speaking with double entendre, uh, who represent Christianity on the television sets and so on, nearly all of them, Preach the first gospel here. And they are good men. 
and God bless them, and they don't mean it. And I will mention one, not to take him down, but because he's so good, and that's Charles Stanley. This is what Charles will tell you is the gospel. Especially as he comes down towards the end of the session where he wants to lead people to make decisions. Now, he doesn't believe this is the gospel. And if you listen to what he says in general, you see he's got much more that he wants to pack into it. But this is what comes out. And most of our folks don't know how to call people to decision on any other basis than this gospel. They don't know how to evangelize for disciples. They don't know how to make trust Jesus fit with repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. And they also are very concerned to get people where they're ready to go. That's not a bad idea. We ought to be ready to go. And all the stories about the person who left the meeting and didn't make the decision and the trolley ran over him. They have a point. But then you have to talk about the ones that the trolley didn't run over. And they were left here until they died with no gospel because they had already had the gospel. So what about getting rid of people, people ready to live? So one way of witnessing is not just if you died tonight, where would you go? But also if you don't die tonight, what are you going to do? <laughs> what then? Right. It's very important to take care of what's going to happen after you die. Unfortunately, that has been set up in a way that doesn't have anything essentially to do with what you do until you die. And in the, in the form that I think every thinking person who is an evangelical Christian would reject. It comes down to something, a version of the gospel that has no connection with the spiritual life. No connection with moral character. And people are left to cope with their life with nothing that helps them. Jesus died to liberate the oppressed. You recognize that gospel? You can stand with him in that battle. That's fundamentally the left-wing gospel. Theologically, it tends to line up politically too, but that's another story I dare not go into. Yes, sir? So I would, on the first one, are you, are you saying it's uh, missing the mark entirely or is it incomplete? It's incomplete. It's essential but incomplete. But see, actually, number two is also essential. Right? It's essential. But if you just take the first one as the full gospel, it won't be anywhere. And that's, that is a standing battle. Read Sojourners. You get one side of it. And these are wonderful people. Jim Wallace is, is a sweet, wonderful man. Uh, But you, the people who normally will listen to him really can't cope with number one. Partly because they don't really believe in sin. You know, sin is a term that has disappeared from our vocabulary. And that's unfortunate because if you don't know what sin is, you're like a farmer that thinks the only answer to weeds is more fertilizer. <laughs> So we are now, and, and actually many people who use the word don't really have a good concept of it that applies very well. But one and two seem to divide the church left and right pretty well. Now the third one is actually falls on both sides depending on which group you're listening to. Uh, and it's much more common than you think. I suspect. I don't know. Individually, you may be way ahead of me on this. But uh, the idea that, well, the gospel is you take care of your church and it'll take care of you. Now, the old form, which Protestants generally think they have 
rejected is the idea that properly ordained people in the church are in charge of the sacraments, and the sacraments are what saves you. Right. So you need to get baptized in the beginning and shriven at the end. And you've got a good shot at it. But you need to do a lot of confessing and other things that are sacraments. And see, that's a perfectly intelligent way of approaching the issue of salvation. And you can understand how human beings would develop that. Because now we've got the whole deal under human control. The Protestants, by and large, reacted against that. But then as Protestantism developed, they got a different system of sacraments, which were right beliefs. And they are in control of them, by the way, did you know? And why should you belong to a particular church? Because they have the right doctrines. And that's why your denomination is better than any other. And we've loosened up a little bit on that, but in my childhood, which was some time ago, Methodists and Baptists had serious doubts about whether or not the others were going to make it. Right? Now, you see, that is, in, in essence, practicing the same sacramental system. That's a, that's a tough one to deal with. It's very attractive because, frankly, people can identify a church. They can identify ministers. It's comforting to believe that you just have to deal with them, and you're okay. They will, as the song says, fix you up with the spirit in the sky, right? <laughs> and you'll be all right. Now, we'll break in just a second now, but I just want to leave this last gospel with you. Put your confidence in Jesus, the whole person. Live with him as his disciple now in the present kingdom of God. Right. Now, you do that by faith in response to God's action. The new birth is from above. And by the way, it's the same place that Pilate's power was from. You remember when Jesus was standing before Pilate? And Pilate said, don't you know I've got the power to kill you? And Jesus said, you wouldn't have any power at all if it wasn't given to you from above. That's the same place that the new birth comes from. It's not born again. Born again is actually a biblical term. But it's birth from above. And what were you, what were we talking about? If you then be risen with Christ, set your mind on things that are above, that's the invisible landscape. That's the invisible landscape. Set your mind on things that are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, because you are dead. That's the good news. That's the good news. Now, then the issue of the human side of holiness becomes a matter of how do you, by your regenerated choice, enter into that by your own activities? How do you come to be the kind of person who just routinely does the kinds of things that Jesus talked about? Because you know that you are doing what is good and in accord with reality, and you may have to struggle with some of your tendencies built into your body that are already galloping in another direction, but that's where growth in grace comes in. So miserable sinner Christianity, as we used to call it, which is you remain a miserable sinner until you die and usually with the thought that your problem is your body and flesh is mistakenly misread as your body. The miserable sinner Christianity is the idea that you never get better. And our implicit theology 
is very much invested in that. Very much invested in it. And in chapter 5 of the renovation, you know how I sort of go over the reasoning on this before I introduce the VIM thing, you know. Uh, because I want people to see the VIM thing in the context of all of the things that say you can't do this. Because you can do it. And if your vision is tied to the kingdom of God and your life in the kingdom of God as an associate of Jesus in what he is doing in world history, then you have got the wherewithal to learn holiness. That is a sweet life-giving stream flowing from God through your life and into the lives of other people.